Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And I'm Jenna. Holy crap, we have a guest. <laughs> <laughs> Out of left field comes someone who snuck into the chat and is here to talk about Miami Vice. <laughs> you just keep pulling me back in. <laughs> well, Jenna, we had to. Had to have you come back for this episode. It is season four, episode seven, titled Missing Hours. Now, there are several, several reasons why we needed Jenna to come back for this. But first, before we get there, it premiered on November 13th, 1987. It is written by Thomas Dish, who this is his only episode that he wrote. Now, there's something about Thomas Dish. This is a bad episode of Miami Vice. And Miami Vice fans know this episode was coming. This is a terrible episode of Miami Vice that we knew that we were going to get here. Now, we're going to have a lot of fun with it, but Thomas Dish is a well-respected sci-fi writer. Three Hugo nominations, nine Nebula nominations. He is a fantastic sci-fi writer. And he's more than just a sci-fi writer. He, he wrote poetry. He also dabbled in children's books. In fact, the children's book series he wrote was The Brave Little Toaster, which... I happen to be the perfect age to remember that movie when it came out, as I was his target audience. Yeah, and that blew me away when I saw that he wrote that short novel, too. It is directed, now bear with me on this name, I think it's Ot De Jong. Looks an awful lot like Eight De Jong. <laughs> 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 this guy is also surprised because he directed the cult fan favorite drop dead pred oh that movie. <laughs> <laughs> there's something for everyone in this episode <laughs> All right, John, I think I think I can guess one of the songs that's going to be in your music segment this week. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead silent. Really? <laughs> kind of wait for you there to, go, to, to run with whatever you're going to say there. <laughs> He's like, okay, what song was it? <laughs> what song is it? <laughs> See, you don't know. Don't, don't act like you know my music. <laughs> Okay, so this week we have obviously James Brown, but first let's talk about Paint the Road by Adrian Bellew. Adrian Bellew, a U.S. musician, songwriter, record producer, and multi-instrumentalist. He was a pioneer with the guitar, mostly for his sound. His sound mimicked car horns, animal noises, industrial sounds, you know, kind of <laughs> abstract. Is he the guy from I am completely from serious police? about this. He he he's really famous because he, he yeah, because he was basically uh like the guy from Police Academy but for guitarists. <laughs> he, he's best known for being the front man and co-guitarist of the band King Crimson from 1981 to 2009. Though he's actually released nearly 20 solo albums as well. What caught I was that he he has worked as a session musician or a touring musician for a lot of very very big names. So he spent tours with Frank Zappa, toured with a, as a musician for David Bowie. So there's your first Bowie reference. <laughs> Damn you, David Bowie! We thought we got rid of you. <laughs> oh yeah, no 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 no. He's clinging to this music segment. He also toured and recorded with the Talking Heads. And even toured with Nine Inch Nails. In 1989, he had a top 10 hit with the song Oh Daddy. And he also had a Grammy nomination in 2005 with Beatbox Guitar in the Best Rock Instrumental Performance category. Most notably for just all the appearances and all of the other big artists. In the mid-70s, he moved to Nashville and joined a, a regionally popular cover band called Sweetheart. Playing gigs locally with Sweetheart in 1970. 77, he was playing at Fanny's Bar when he was discovered by Frank Zappa, who was tipped off by his chauffeur to go check him out. So Zappa didn't invite him to tour right away. And so by the time Zappa invited him to, to come tour with him, Sweetheart had broke up. So he flew to L.A. all by himself and he auditioned. And he actually screwed up the first audition, but he talked Zappa into giving him a second audition. And there you go. He started opening shows for Zappa uh, and even appeared on Zappa's 79 album, Sheik Your Booty, Your Bowdy? Your... Very strange name. <laughs> <laughs> Even appears on a track. 
He would later say that he went to the Frank Zappa School of Rock. After touring with Zappa, dabbled with a few of his own bands. He would have bands called Gaga and the Tom Tom Club. But he would also tour with Bowie, and contribute to Dave Bowie's live album Stage, and also record as a session musician for the album Lodger. So, and then he would start doing session work with the Talking Heads. And actually, a few of the Talking Heads band members sent him to replace the lead singer, David Byrne. But he was like, no, nah, guys, I don't want to do that. Like, that would be kind of a D-bag move. So instead, they did a spinoff band called the Tom Tom Club. Things didn't work out. People's feelings were upset. Some of his stuff was erased that didn't make the album. So essentially, uh-huh. he went back to doing solo work and did a pretty much did solo work and worked with also did session work until as well as continuing to perform with King Crimson until 2013 when Trent Reznor would announce that Bellow be Nine Inch Nails new touring guitarist. But that also wouldn't last very long, long enough for him to do some session work on Nine Inch Nails hesitation mark. But yeah, we found someone else. So he is actually still, <laughs> still gets together and does shows with King Crimson. So now we move on Damn. to the epic James Brown with the song I Got You, I Feel Good. James Brown is the godfather of soul. He is an icon of 20th century popular music and he's had a career that's lasted 50 years. Doing research on James Brown, I learned two things. One, he had a huge influence over music over that 50 years. And... Two, in real life, he was not the best person. In fact, he (laughs) often made very poor, poor choices. (laughs) We're going to learn a little bit about both. As his career began as a gospel singer in Georgia, actually his early life is really interesting. And I I think you could even make a movie about it. I mean, as he grew up poor, uh, there's performing for change he boxed as a teen and then it was actually at 16 was arrested for robbery and was sent to a juvenile detention center where he would start a quartet with his fellow cellmates until he would be released once being released he would join a vocal group called the Gospel Starlighters. So the Gospel Starlighters also featured Bobby Birds. And actually, Bobby Birds was uh, the lead singer, as James Brown was actually just a backup singer. So the Gospel Starlighters would become the Flames. And in the late 50s, they would get a little bit, they would start touring and get a little bit of popularity. And they would become the famous Flames, because obviously they're famous now. (laughs) And they would have a couple hits with the songs Please, Please, Please and Try Me. So, and Brown had uh, built a reputation as a tireless performer. As they were trying to get big, they actually reached out to Little Richard. And I mean, just I don't think people even realize how massive an impact Little Richard had on things. Because Little Richard actually helped them, convince them to audition for his manager and actually helped them get signed by his manager. Which actually, his manager then got them their first record deal. So, but after they got the record deal, things would kind of get moved around and and the band would kind of reform as the band would break up. They would let go of Clint Brantley, Little Richard's manager. They would hire Ben Bart and they would basically reform band more set around uh james brown as the lead singer what was what's interesting to me is that all the original members that left the old lead singer bobby bird stayed and actually continued with what was now james brown and the flames yeah that is surprising that he that they would be able to keep him you would think that he would say okay fine you guys have fun i'm gonna go start my own band yeah exactly james brown's success really peaked in the 60s with his hits papa's got a brand new bag i got you and it's a man's 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 world by the time the 70s hit he had kind of gone away from gospel and actually got more in the funk changed the name of the band or reformed the band again This time, the band would be known as the JBs, and he would release records, Got Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, and Payback, and he would really kind of usher in funk. And and not just there. At that time, the Collins brothers, who were in his backup band, they would eventually move on and become integral members of Parliament Funkadelic, which is the funk band that uh, George Clinton is famous for. Yeah. 
Damn. So from Little Richard to George Clinton, uh, we're having an influence. L- so, Little Richard, James Brown, and uh, and Funkadelic all together. Like, damn. And George Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. So the 70s would be a confusing time. So uh, a lot of people don't know that Brown kept a strict non-alcohol and drug policy for him and his band members and actually routinely fired people for if he caught them drinking or using drugs. But now here comes some of the poor choices he made. So we'll start with... <laughs> um, <laughs> In 1972, he openly supported Richard Nixon in the election, which (laughs) hurt his sales in 73, and things hit kind of a lull. He would continue to see success in the the 70s, including 1976's single Hot, I Need to Be Loved, 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 Loved. God, he had a thing about that with song titles. (laughs) Which, uh, that song specifically borrowed a riff from David Bowie's fame. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away from him. David Bowie's everywhere. So, David and once Phil again, <laughs> once again, we're stealing from David Bowie here. <laughs> so, granted, the riff was actually was originally created by Carlos Alomar, but was brought to Bowie and Lennon, who wrote the song Fame, and then ripped off by Brown. By the way, Carlos Alomar, who wrote the riff, briefly in Brown's backing band in the 60s. <laughs> and I believe he was one of people fired for drinking and doing drugs. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. A vicious cycle. The reason wait, I brought wait. up the non drug thing. Wait. wait. Okay. Be- you're saying that David Bowie stole a riff from someone. Sorry, let me back up. That James Brown stole a riff from David Bowie, who actually stole it from someone who worked for James Brown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Carlos Alomar was in, his, in Brown's backing band in the 60s. He would leave. <laughs> he would then create a riff that he would sell to John Lennon and David Bowie, and they would use it in the song Fame. And then James Brown would hear that riff and go, man, that sounds good. And he would steal it. <laughs> probably sounded good because that guy used to work for you in the 60s (laughs) in the late 70s early 80s so 77 to 81 popularity fell off with the emergence of disco and this is where that strict non-alcohol drug policy kind of falls off because once once the 80s came about rumors of drug use started to swarm around james brown primarily the use of PCP and also used to like to put mix cocaine into his menthol cigarettes. Damn. Um, yeah, Whoa. getting getting things done. That will uh, mess you up. Holy crap! <laughs> so even though musically his popularity was down, he would still maintain his popularity just by appearing in films. He would appear in Blues Brothers, Doctor Detroit, Rocky Four. He also would change, reform the band once again from the. Jeez, and now they would become the Soul Generals. But that's the last time, I swear. We're never going to change the name again, guys. <laughs> <laughs> he would also start teaming up with other artists. He would have a hit in 84 after teaming up with Africa Bombada with the song Unity. Africa Bombada also was featured in our music previously. And actually, in the late 80s, early 90s, he influenced a lot of rap. Actually, uh, artists such as da- Big Daddy Kane... And MC Hammer basically sampled James Brown's songs in some of their songs. And one of James Brown's songs was very popular with breakdancers to the point Curtis Blow once said it was the national anthem breakdancing. Hmm. And he would continue to make music and do cameos into the 2000s and even into uh, all the way up until his death in 2006. Now, got to talk about the dark side of James Brown. Throughout the 80s, and, and uh, well, through his whole life, he had gotten in trouble with, the, he had been in trouble with the law, stemming all the way back from his robbery arrest and, when he was 16. But especially in the 80s, he would be arrested multiple times for domestic violence. In the 80s, he would actually serve two and a half years of two concurrently running six-year sentences <laughs> for aggravated assault and other felonies. And dude, some of them stories are crazy. Involving like car chases and stuff. He made some Damn. bad choices. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow he got out of it by only serving two and a half years. So not to mention years of tax trouble. And to culminate all of that, he had four failed marriages. And when he died in 2006, 
at the reading of his will, it was revealed that his will was actually pretty old. It had not been updated in quite some time and only recognized six of his children. Oh, <laughs> at the time of his death, at the time of his death, he recognized nine children. That's important. So only six of them were recognized in the will, mostly because two of them hadn't been born yet. And there was one failed marriage that hadn't happened yet. Big fight broke out over his estate, which allowed people to get basically say like, hey, he's also my dad to get their DNA tested. And so he recognized nine children of, uh, by the time he died, we know that there are at least three more children, illegitimate children from extramarital affairs. He could have up to 13 children. One is the jury's still out on one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's continued all the way up from 2006 to in 2015. Yeah, the ex-wife who was left out of the will because the will was made before they had ever gotten married. Uh, she was granted a right, some rights to his estate. She was ruled his widow. So, and that was in 2015. I had a feeling the, this was uh, coming with James Brown professionally. You can't be any more accomplished than James Brown was. Uh, no. Like I said, he's such an iconic musician and performer, but just not the greatest guy in real life and, and <laughs> made some pretty bad decisions and was arrested and drug issues lasted at least until 98 when he went into rehab for prescription drugs, which is... Well, I will say two things about James Brown. One, Rocky IV is the best Rocky Come at me. Go ahead. Try and convince me it's not the best one. Because I live in America. Best, it's the best moment in film history, okay? Everyone just shut up. That's the way it is. You're really <laughs> going to All you're that. doing is just making it harder for people to believe you when you say that this episode is good. You're adding more fuel to people's fight against you. <laughs> to appreciate James Brown, the musician, go to YouTube, search for James Brown live or concert. And there's a bunch of them that are full concerts that are on YouTube. They are amazing. I never get tired of watching James Brown live. Oh, yeah. And his live stuff, he was actually one of the first artists to really sell live albums. Like, they didn't sell very well uh, to begin with. Uh, like, uh, back in the day, live albums didn't really sell very well. When he started releasing live albums, some of his most successful albums were live albums. Like, he completely changed that. Yep. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I gave my final thoughts about James Brown. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. That's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goWithTheHeat.com. Before you turn it off, hey, your podcaster platform or your your podcatcher you can tell it like hey go ahead and cut off the episodes early don't do it right now we gotta give a shout out actually because jenna was on this episode not that we're happy that she was on here happy to give a send off the nook man happy to be here for jumping the shark but just in case you didn't know jenna created all of the show art for go with the heat our logo our the design on the website everything that you see our facebook icon our our twitter bio picture everything all of our design work has been done by jenna oh hey thanks now i just need to <laughs> go and you. expertly crop out all of their faces and put trudy's face <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah if you'd like to see more of that or maybe a sticker pack coming in the future of that artwork check out that website go with the .com. click on about us you can find everything and all the ways to contact us click on subscribe you can find all the ways that you can find the show click on support we would love your support. Support step number one. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and give us a review. Two, email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Three, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We would love your support. Be sure to check those things out. Check out the website. Check us out on social media at go with the heat on Twitter, facebook.com slash go with the heat. Brand new Instagram account. Can you guess where it is? At go with the heat. <laughs> <laughs> people are that's never gonna, gonna get that dominic <laughs> that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pals <laughs>